Welcome to Game Theory, where my Alolan form is a sunburnt tourist wearing board shorts and a fanny pack. Well, goodbye, cruel world. Ah! Oh! Uh, uh, uh. oh, right. I'm already dead. Ah! All right, all right, all right. I know, MatPat, again. You read the title, get over it. I'm pretty sure I don't have to explain who MatPat is, but I do need to bring this up. When this theory first came out about four months ago, Proto Mario actually did a video response to him the next day, and he did a decent job, in my opinion, for it. But I feel I can add more stuff to the table. This may include original arguments they came up with, or expanding on what Proto said in some capacity. Just putting it out there, let's begin this. A bolt of brilliance! Ugh. Man, that sounds cringy. With seven generations of games and 805 total Pokemon before even including Mega Evolutions and Alola forms, it's easy to assume that the creators of these games are just mindlessly pumping out new designs to fill their roster of merchandisable plushies. And uh, looking at some of the creative decisions they've made, you might be justified in thinking that. So this doesn't really have much to do with the theory itself, but I want to tear this statement down a little bit. First off, I'm surprised you of all people in MatPat would be using Jinx as a point in this regard, because he already made a theory debunking this. Actually, I take that back. He made two videos about the subject, while well, the first was inconclusive with his standards, the second one had him saying this. So is Jinx racist? I feel 100% confident saying no. Like most other Pokemon, her origins harken back to Japanese folklore. In the end, the moral of the story is this. People can make a fuss and then wait 12 years for an online web series to find the answers for them, or they can just do a little research before flipping out. Now, I find this really suspect, since you're saying that the creators are mindlessly pumping out these designs when you yourself have done the research and saying that Jinx is justified and has a lot of inspiration behind it. And yes, I realize that those videos are about six years old at this point in time, but MatPat does like to reference a lot of his old theories and videos. Hey. I can completely understand if a person can change their opinion on something, but he proved that there was more to Jinx than just what he's saying here. So, in my eyes, this is really weird to bring up. In a time when gamers are more accepting than ever to play different characters, Overwatch embraces diversity. While the characters in TF2 may be from all across the world, outside of the Demo Man and maybe the Pyro, they're all white males. Well, never mind. I think I found the reason. Let's just throw this out the window then. Goodbye. Oi! Stop doing your trash. Honey, I can't find my keys. Oh, oh, wait. Here they are. Oh, never mind. It was just the cleft key. I'm still missing those keys. Other dishonorable mentions: Doug Trio with crappy weaves, Living Sandcastle, and Pedo Bear. Who, if the design didn't already clue you in that they were phoning it in, has the name Beware. Beware. The designs are essentially subpar or bad since he's using the terms phoned it in. I mean, fine, if you want to say that due to your own personal taste, but I wouldn't say these Pokemon are lazy in concept. But what's even the point of this? I understand that this is more of a joke and such, you could literally cut this out of the video and nothing would be lost. I realize that MatPat's gotten into filler territory a lot in the past, and has actually gotten worse with it. Last month I went to a YouTube event in New York where Jacksepticeye and I happened to win a taco challenge judged by the world. <sighs> Damn tacos. But this, this has nothing to do with the actual video itself, other than, you know, it's Pokemon that he's talking about. Even then, I could argue that the designs do have thought behind them. Oh, mainly because he says this. Some may be a bit phoned in, others demonstrate that a lot of thought actually went into these designs and backstory. Then it plays there isn't a lot of thought for the design of the Pokemon you decide to bring up, but Pokemon like Klefki, Alone and Dugtrio, and Beware, there are a lot of thought and lore behind them if you're willing to look. Klefki especially since it's a reference to superstition of fairies of faithful. Like how fairies are said to steal small objects like keys and shoes, or how it's based upon the superstition of carrying iron to ward off mischief from fey creatures. Why not? It is a steel type and it can actually hurt other fairies. Alone Dugtrio holds a reference to Pele's hair, which is a thing you can find in Hawaiian volcanoes. You know, the location that Alola is based off of? Hell, even Beware has elements to it being based off a of red panda and off the professional wrestling submission of bear hugs, which ties into its typing. I'm not saying you can't call the designs lazy or such, but MatPat's talking about the
about the backstory of these creatures and where they came from, inspirational-wise. Yeah, that kind of raises a red flag. Though some may be a bit phoned in, others demonstrate that a lot of thought actually went into these designs and backstory. Case in point, the Alolan Pokedex entry for Donald Trump. <laughs> I mean, Young Goose. You can tell the difference because Young Goose's hair looks more realistic. Anyway, the Pokedex tells us that despite the fact that Young Goose debuted in Generation 7 with the release of Sun and Moon, it's not actually native to the Alolan region. Young Goose did not originally live in Alola, but was imported from another region. Alright, so while I do have a point against this, I do want to bring up something about the Pokedex and when I talk about it. First off, I don't believe the Pokedex to be a reliable source when it comes to basing arguments off of why a Pokemon does this, or has this ability, or why it's evil, since there are conflicting points in it. One of the biggest would have to be Macargo, whose original entry said that it was as hot as lava, but other entries later would say it was hotter than the sun. Which, you know, is kind of stupid, since if you look at the Pokemon, its name, its classification, it's obviously based off magma. Or how about Shedinja, the Pokemon who, if you look in the back of, sucks your soul out. <laughs> So, when I look towards the Pokedex, and there being some questionable reasoning to use them to justify things, like saying a Pokemon is evil, I find it a bit hard to swallow. Now, when I use the Pokedex in my own arguments, that doesn't mean I acknowledge its credibility. The idea is, the Pokedex is incredible, but that doesn't mean you can't use people's own logic when they use the Pokedex against them. Now, onto my actual point against MatPat. Since before this video came out, MatPat put out another video basically saying you can't trust the Pokedex. IRONY! So I find it really ironic that he's relying on it for this theory, when he just basically, you know, said it was full of lies. I understand that this theory is more lore-based, and that the idea that Rattata adapting to a new species is really solid, especially since it has a real-world parallel to it, as MatPat explains. But it's really strange for MatPat to instantly turn against another theory he made, especially since he's willing to use previous theories to back up his current ones. I mean, look at his Mario theories, his FNAF theories, there's a lot. <laughs> Totally pathetic, unreliable. Young Goose being imported into Alola means that it's technically an invasive species. In real life, an invasive species is any living organism, plant or animal, that's not native to an ecosystem. And while that may not sound all that threatening, approximately 42% of all endangered species on Earth are on those at-risk lists because of an invasive species that wound up in its part of the world. <laughs> Pat, I don't normally get on to you for this since it's a point that I've made before in other videos, but this is a much more egregious case. In your Splatoon theory, you actually gave a hint as to where to find the articles on the squids that you used. You gave the title so I could actually find where that's from. But here, there's nothing! Absolutely nothing! Honestly, I honestly could spend the rest of my night looking up sources, but seriously, that's an incredibly random number, and it's not my job to actually look this up, it's yours. You're the one who's presenting it. Totally pathetic, unreliable. Brought young goose to Alola to eat the Rattata, the Rattata adapted and found a way to survive, which means that now you're left with a huge population of young goose that have to eat something else and are gonna find it no matter what. After all, as the Pokedex entry says, With its sharp fangs, it will bite anything. It wanders around in a never-ending search for food, which means someone else is on the chomping block. And you know it's gonna be one of those cute little ones. Okay, so nitpick alert, but why would a regular Vulpix be on the chopping block? It's not even native to Alola. I understand it's an example, but but it's a pretty bad example. Secondly, if we're talking about food and such, there's plenty of berry trees that Pokemon can eat from. We do have to remember that while Pokemon do have a lot of real-life inspirations, as in the case of Young Goose and the small Asian Mongoose, but you can't really rely on that since Pokemon are not exactly the same animals as we have in real life. I mean, you tell me where I can find a dragon in real life and I'll pay you 50 bucks. And now I'm not talking Komodo dragons. And they come up and they go... <laughs> Going back to the food thing I was talking about, since you can catch young goose carrying berries in Sun and Moon, there exists the possibility of them being omnivores, meaning that they won't just eat other Pokemon, they'll eat other things. Hell, the Pokedex actually says that they'll eat anything. Totally pathetic, unreliable. Then, knowing that young goose prefer to hunt close to the ground and only during the day, I eliminated any Pokemon who were active at night or tended to stay in trees. Lastly, there were a ton of bug Pokemon across all of these routes, but bugs have huge populations, and it would be difficult for young goose to really damage the overall numbers of those populations, so I didn't really consider them at risk. In the end, I was left with the following list of Pokemon that will, in the near future, be completely wiped out from the islands by the overpopulation of young goose and gumshoes. Slowpoke? Vullaby, Delibird, and brace yourself because here come some real fan favorites, Igglybuff, Pichu, 
and Eevee. Every single one of these Pokemon species will be wiped clean from the Alolan Isles unless something is done to combat the Yungu's infestation. That is six entire species suddenly gone from an ecosystem. You can bet that's gonna throw some food chains into chaos. And here's the problem that I hold with this video. MatPat is only using real world logic with this. And since this is a fact, Pokemon are more intelligent and powerful than real world animals. And while this can apply to young goose, it's at a disadvantage when compared to some of its prey. You see, as many people who are fans of the games will tell you, most of these Pokemon have their own special abilities and can defend themselves in various ways. Young Goose is a Pokemon in and of itself, but that doesn't mean it has the ability to use electricity, psychic powers, or other useful attacks naturally on its own. MatPat is ignoring the fact that Pokemon that could go extinct have the ability to fight back with these abilities to defend themselves. But there's something else. Let's start with something that's really weird that MatPat seems to have ignored. Volibee. You see, this Pokemon doesn't really fit into the requirements that he listed. Then, knowing that young goose prefer to hunt close to the ground and only during the day, you can only encounter Volibee and an ambush in the mountain area of the first island. Well, unless you count Poke Pelago, but I, I don't. So I don't know why he's counting that one. Actually, that raises another question and shocked this up to poor wording, but I eliminated any Pokemon who were active at night or tended to stay in trees. I think he was trying to say that we're only active at night because all these Pokemon are active at night. Even then, that's a weird thing to bring up since these Pokemon are apparently on the chopping block that are awake during that time and MatPat is just assuming that these Pokemon won't defend themselves. Or they're young if we're talking about Pokemon eggs. Dillybird can actually manage to be a bit more debatable. Do the timing of MatPat's video, since the Pokemon actually migrates to a different location in Ultra Sun and Moon. Seaward Cave, where there aren't any young goose around. And yeah, I'm counting Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon in this, since technically his theory came out on the day after they were released, which, you know, I understand that he was processing this theory so it could get out in time for the Pokemon games, but since he's using Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon footage, I feel like I can bring it up but not use it as the crutch of my argument. Even if you don't want to count those two games, Delibird do have the ability to fly away, despite them being based off of penguins. Now we've got Eevee, which is a first for Sun and Moon because they're wild Pokemon now, which hasn't really happened in other games. This suggests that the Pokemon is more common than usual, which can also be translated for Igglybuff. You can't find them in the wild in other games, and the same with Pichu. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, we have to consider Alolan forms. You see, creatures don't just adapt overnight. Adaptations take time since they're genetic mutations. This is basic Darwin. Organisms will inherit the mutation over multiple generations, which we can see with Alolan Rattata, because remember, Alola had regular Rattata on their shores before the introduction of Young Goose. And this means that Young Goose had to have been around for long enough for the Rattata specifically to adapt to the Young Goose. And it's reasonable to believe that during this time, the ecosystem of Alola adapted as well. And we do have some real-world examples of ecosystems adapting to deal with invasive species. I mean, there's the Australian Dingo, which, while controversial in its time, is a species that has been listed as a pest, but has been also been used to control the population of invasive species like feral cats and wild pigs. I find it hard to believe that in all the time it took for Alolan Rattata to become what it is while dealing with this invasive species, it was the only thing that adapted to it. Especially depending on the transition of Rattata adapting, the food supply for young goose would be more diversified. Also convenient that MatPet ignores a few other Pokemon that are located on these routes that could potentially be predators of young goose. You've got Pokemon like Growlithe, Bagon, Rufflet, Lillipup, and that's just going on the assumption that the predatory Pokemon or Terra Tutorial Pokemon would act exactly like their real-life counterparts, which is what MatPat is doing, and I'm just going off of his logic here. Chaos. Luckily, all of them are species that appear elsewhere in the Pokemon world, so no one species would truly be gone forever, or... At least, not gone forever solely because of Young Goose. Because that's not where the story ends. Young Goose is only one of the invasive species brought onto Alola by humans. For example, according to the Dex entry in Pokemon Sun, Grimer was brought in to solve a problem with garbage, developed over time into this form. Besides the difference in color, look at those teeth. The Pokedex entry from Moon would tell us that those are actually, quote, lumps of toxins. If one falls off, lethal poisons leak out. So the second species inserted onto these islands by humans just so happens to contain lethal poisons. And since Grimers are specifically used to treat polluted wastewater, you can bet that those toxic crystals are gonna do a lot of damage to the sea life around Haoli City and the Cape of Ula Ula Island. Okay, I have to question a few things here because for one, Alamomola can only be found in Booklet Hill. Why are you putting it in this example here? And Magikarp, really? The most common water type Pokemon in the world, and I- ah, I am the universe! 
Grammars! Also, by your own words, Grammars are used to treat polluted wastewater. Wouldn't that mean that they could potentially eat other Grammars toxins? I mean, I know that sounds gross, but we're talking about a Pokemon who, if the Dex is to be believed, is made up of sludge, is willing to eat toxic sludge from factories, and is willing to do some of the most disgusting things. It wouldn't be unreasonable that Grammar would get whatever slime it can, poisonous to eat or not, even if it came from another Grimer or even Muck. And this all ignores the adaptation that I brought up before, ignoring that when Grammar started looking like this, that it might have been a problem. But since there's no sign of that and there are tons of Alolan Grimer, no regular Grimer left in Alola, with no actual pollution going around, heck, there's a recycling center now, one would suggest that there would be a method to stop this, otherwise we would have seen already a huge change in the ecosystem while Alolan Grimer were starting to appear and actually have these little teeth. Then there's Makuhita, also brought into the region by humans. Since these guys train themselves by slamming their bodies into trees, the plant life around Route 2 is absolutely gonna suffer under his body slams. That in turn affects the nesting sites for birds found there like Spiro. And lastly, perhaps- Even though we have Pokemon that will ambush you in a tree if you got close- Oh, and uh, Makuhita is a fighting type. You know, the type that's weak to flying type Pokemon. The moment that Makuhita attacks a tree with a Spiro on it, it's gonna be attacked and knocked out. Run, fat boy, run! The single biggest threat to the islands, Meowth. Meowth! That's right! Yet again, the Pokedex tells us, This Pokémon was not originally found in Alola. Human actions caused a surge in their numbers, and they went feral. Honestly, it's another story. Invasion in Alola, meanwhile, means even more likelihood that bird Pokémon start diminishing in number, absolutely putting Piggy Peck on the menu, and... Once again, I bring up the argument that Pokémon can fight back, but let's focus on pick -a -pack, which, you know... It's a Pokemon that's all over Alola and wouldn't necessarily be extinct because of Lone Meowth, who's only located on two islands, and only one location in one of them. Even then, Pikapet can actually learn biting moves naturally, which can protect it from Pokemon like Alola Meowth and Young Goose, both of which are weak to fighting attacks. And while this can apply to other birds, you gotta remember one other thing. Spiro, Delibird, and Bullaby can be found in locations where Meowth can't. Yes, you can say that Meowth could migrate, but I can easily say the same thing about these Pokemon. And that's not taking into account that there are fighting Pokemon that can protect potentially fight against the invasion of Alola and Meowth. Mankey, Crabrawler, Makuhita, or how about Pokemon like Growlithe, Bagon, and etc. Not so much over food, but territorial issues here. Since it shares some routes with Young Goose, basically ensuring the disappearance of Pichu. You know, you are forgetting a fundamental thing right here. While this does sound like I'm making a broken record, I want to go in more in depth with this. Pichu can defend itself with electricity. In fact, this falls in the line with actual natural defenses that prey can use, much like how some animals can create a poison, or animals that resemble poisonous animals that act as a deterrent to predators. This is something that MatPat never goes into, he just assumes that the Pokémon he thinks are prey can't do anything to fight back. And that's pretty much the video. Honestly, I don't have much more to say than I already have. I understand that I'm proudly spinning my wheels with this, but as I said in previous videos, I just like doing it for fun nowadays. I'm Skull Common, and remember to examine your fandom, well, at least I'm done with MatPat for a while. Uh, coming soon.